bring your brokenness and I'll bring mine. People ask me, what are some of my goals with the church? What do I want the church to be? What do I want the church to be like? This is one of my goals as a pastor. That this would be a church where this would literally take place. That I would bring my brokenness and you bring yours. Because so many times we walk in churches and we think we have to look, act, and behave totally differently than we do the rest of the week. It's amazing sometimes some of the people that I get to meet that they are miraculously healed of cussing the second they walk into a church. But then the healing like goes away the second they walk out in the parking lot. It's amazing. But let's be honest of who we are. There are times where we're broken and we're struggling and it's okay. We don't need to act like we've got it all together because we don't. And then the next line she says, because love can heal what hurt divides. You see, if you want to find a church divided, you will find a church where it's not okay to be broken. Where it's not okay to be yourself. That's a church divided. But if you want to find a healthy church, it's a church where people who are broken love each other and love each other through their brokenness. That was all free. Last week, we looked at our nature as humans and the fact that we're slaves. I said that before we could really understand the true reality of freedom, we had to understand our true nature, and that is the nature of to be a slave. We are slaves to sin. But Jesus tells us that there's a way out of that slavery. In John chapter 8, verse 31, he says, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That if we truly want to know what freedom is, we will find it in the truth of who Jesus is as the Son of God. He goes on, says, Very truly I tell you that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. There's our human nature. We're slaves to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So last week, I made a statement that I don't believe people have to die for us to have freedom. And some people will push back and cringe on that, and that's okay. I only ask that you listen to the whole message before you shoot any darts at me. I know this is a very dangerous statement to make, so I want to be clear I do not make this statement meaning that there is no value in the lives of people who have given their life for this country. I do, not, I do believe that we need these brave men and women who serve our country to protect us. And, and I honor and respect every person who fought, for, who fought and who fights for our country. Up here in front I have a, a picture of my grandpa that I'm actually named after. Um, uh, Lawrence Dorsum, my middle name's Lawrence. Um, for so long, I was actually embarrassed by my middle name until I, you know, really found out who my grandfather was. And he was, I was seven when he um, died from uh, pancreatic cancer. But he fought in World War II. I also have his uh, fighter pilot jacket up here. He was a nose gunner in World War II. Um, I think to even get in a plane in the position that he was in um, deserves a medal. Um, if you're not familiar with a nose gunner, um, pretty much if you look at the old World War II planes, on the bottom of it is this glass dome 
um, and he would lay down in it um, and control the gun from there. And so that was his position. Pretty much he laid underneath the pilot above him. Um, he actually received a purple heart um, through because bullets coming through the glass. Um, he actually um, had shrapnel that um, hit his leg. And so he received a purple heart for that. Um, like I said, he deserved a medal just for simply getting in a position like that and being shot at. Um, but I have deep respect for the people who, who serve our country. So that is not um, what I'm saying. I'm not saying that I have anything against people who fight for our country. So don't hear me and think that, okay? Please, hopefully. Um, so the question that has been stirring in my mind that has brought me to a deeper understanding of freedom is this. Is freedom really free if someone pays a price? Is freedom really free if someone pays a price? And if it isn't free, is freedom what we truly desire? If freedom isn't free, then is it really what we desire as Americans? So look at this scripture. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to Romans um, chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Who are those who have died? We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him and through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Has been set free from sin. So I, let me ask you this question. If, is it really freedom that we desire? Is it really freedom that we desire? Is it really the freedom our country gives us that makes us feel safe? Think about these things. Is it the freedom that our country gives us what makes us feel free, what makes us feel safe? Is it the, the right to bear arms? Is that what gives us freedom? Or is it our right to vote? Maybe it's our freedom of speech. I know. Um, it's the rights you have when you're a criminal. Those are what make us feel free, right? Maybe it's a right to a fair trial for all those criminals out there. Nope. I, okay, I know it. Here's the one that is the kicker. This is what makes us know that we have freedom. It's the right to be taxed fairly. There's our answer right there. That is how we know we have freedom. To get to the point here. I don't think it is freedom that we're actually talking about. We in America mistake our rights and our privileges as Americans, as having freedom. But what value is freedom if the freedom we love and talk about so much as Americans cannot actually truly give us freedom? To answer my question, freedom isn't free. In the American sense, 
because it does cost us something. People pay a price for us to be taxed fairly. People pay a price for us to vote for us to have the privileges that we have as a democracy. There's prices that are paid. But I think the real matter that we mistake for freedom is not freedom, it's grace. I think what we truly desire in life is God's grace. So many times we look at the freedoms that we have which are really just rights and privileges when you think about it. We look at those things and we can mistake them for things that we need, that we have to have those things in order for us to be free. But is it possible for us not to have the right to vote and truly be free? Is it possible for for us to be taxed very harshly, but yet be free? Is it possible for us to not have the right to bear arms, but yet still be free? If you define your freedom based on the rights and privileges of our government, no. No. You can't have freedom if you do not have those rights and privileges. But if you're seeking something deeper, which I believe we are, the true freedom that we seek is the freedom that we receive through the grace of Jesus Christ. It is only within God's grace that free freedom is found. Freedom stems from God's grace It costs you and I nothing. No person had to pay a price for you to receive grace. It was a free gift. It was grace. In fact, it's so free that to put any requirement on it in order for it to be received is to cheapen its value you take away the value of grace if you put a price tag on it if you have to do something in order to earn it you take away its value the deepest understanding of freedom is found in grace the freedoms that we are given that are given to us by our country they do not take away fear these freedoms they don't make us feel safe okay let's just take a poll here how many of you feel safe 100% of the time with the freedoms that you have How many of you have hope for eternal life based on the freedom and privileges that you have as Americans? Anybody? Okay. Do our freedoms as Americans enable a person to be the person that God created us to be? Do the privileges that we have as Americans enable us to be who God created us to be? Is it possible to be who God created us to be apart from those rights and privileges? Do the the rights and privileges as Americans that we have, do they give us strength to be unafraid in the midst of life's darkest moments? So Paul goes on in Romans 6. He says in verse 8, Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. 
The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Verse 14, for sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. You're not under the law, but you are under grace. You see, it's the grace of God that sets us free. It is God's grace that enables someone to battle cancer and live life still unafraid. It is God's grace that gives you the ability to have eternal life. It is God's grace that enables us to not fear what will happen next in our country. Even in the midst of times of fear, we can have hope. Because of God's grace. Because no matter what happens to us as a country, no matter what rights they give us or what rights they take away from us, the one thing they cannot take away from you is your soul. They cannot control your soul as much as we sometimes would like to say they're controlling it. They're not. You have the ultimate control over who you are as a person. If you want to exercise the greatest freedom that you have as a human being, we had better start taking seriously the choice that God has given us and that he gives each one of us. You see, God gives us a free will. He gives us a choice to choose him or to reject him. No law can ever take that away. They can illegalize Christianity in America, but they cannot take away your God. They can't control your God. That choice to follow him and to live a life that seeks to live in relationship with God. I believe that choice is where true freedom is found. We mistake our freedom for rights and privileges, but true freedom is not the liberty to do anything we please, but the liberty to do what is right, to do what we ought. And we're created to be in relationship with God. The one decision that we should make that should be above all things is to have the chance, to have the liberty of our own free will to do what we ought. Not to do what we can because the government says it's okay. Where do we find our freedom? Because if our freedom is wrapped up in our government, I don't know that you will ever find true freedom. True freedom is found in God's grace. That no matter what you do, no matter how broken you are, he loves you. He loves even the criminal who breaks those laws that the government says they're not allowed to. He loves those people. It's God's grace where freedom is found. So when we celebrate our independence, don't get me wrong, celebrate our independence because it's something to be celebrated. We would be a completely different country without our independence, right? But if you look back at our history, not necessarily the main, but one of the main reasons our country was founded was to separate from a religious tyranny. 
Hence, we have separation of church and state. Um, and it's not, um, just to clarify, it's not a separation of church and state in the sense that um, we can't have the Ten Commandments on the courthouse lawn. That, that, it's, not, it's the separation of church and state in the sense that the state can't come in and dictate that there's going to be one like religion. So Trump can't say, everyone has to be United Methodist or eh, you can't you know, be a church. That is the reason for separation of church and state. Why? Because Henry VIII, Church of England, if you want to go through all the history, I'll do it really fast for you. Um, he wanted to divorce his wife, but the Pope wouldn't let him divorce his wife because divorce in the Catholic Church isn't allowed to happen. But he wanted to divorce like multiple wives. And so Pope said, no, it's not going to happen. And Henry VIII said, okay, you do whatever you want. I'm the king. I'm going to create my own religion. And so he created what is now known as the Anglican Church, which is the Church of England. England. Separation. America. So there are religious reasons for coming to here. So even in the foundation of our country is seeking true freedom from someone telling us what we can and cannot do. But people in England would say that they have freedom too. But what freedom are we seeking? You see, I think if we're going to use freedom in the proper sense, the only way we can define freedom is based on a freedom that we receive from Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate freedom that we will have. We'll still have rights and privileges. But when you think about it, when we give our life to Christ... We lay down those rights and privileges. We put them down and we say, God, we want you to do with our lives as you will. To surrender to his grace for our lives. That's a freedom that our government cannot give us. It's a freedom that I believe is deeper than our government. It's a freedom that controls our inside, not just our outside. What freedom do you seek? Because when I think of freedom, I think of something that's free. What freedom do you seek? I hope it's God's grace.